General Santierra was right in his surmise. Such was the exact nature of the assistance which Gaspar Ruiz, peasant's son of peasants, received from the royalist family whose daughter had opened the door of their miserable refuge to his extreme distress. Her somber resolution ruled the madness of her father and the trembling bewilderment of her mother. She had asked the strange man on the doorstep, Who wounded you? The soldier, senor, Gaspar Ruiz had answered in a faint voice. Patriots? Yes. What for? Deserter, he gasped, leaning against the wall under the scrutiny of her black eyes. I was left for dead over there. She led him through the house, out to a small hut of clay and reeds, lost in the long grass of the overgrown orchard. He sank on a heap of maize straw in a corner, and sighed profoundly. No one will look for you here, she said, looking down at him. Nobody comes near us. We too have been left for dead. He stirred uneasily on his heap of dirty straw, and the pain in his neck made him groan deliriously. I shall show Esteban some day that I am alive yet, he mumbled. He accepted her assistance in silence, and the many days of pain went by. Her appearances in the hut brought him relief and became connected with the feverish dreams of angels which visited his couch. For Gaspar Ruiz was instructed in the mysteries of his religion, and had even been taught to read and write a little by the priest of his village. He waited for her with patience and saw her pass out of the dark hut and disappear in the brilliant sunshine with poignant regret. He discovered that, while he lay there feeling so very weak, he could, by closing his eyes, evoke her face with considerable distinctness, and this discovered faculty charmed the long, solitary hours of his convalescence. Later, when he began to regain his strength, he would creep at dusk from his hut in the house and sit on the step of the garden door. In one of the rooms, the mad father paced to and fro, muttering to himself with short, abrupt laughs. In the passage, sitting on a stool, the mother sighed and moaned. The daughter, in rough, threadbare clothing, and her white, haggard face, half hidden by a coarse manta, stood, leaning against the lintel of the door. Gaspar Ruiz, with his elbows propped on his knees and his head resting in his hands, talked to the two women in an undertone. The common misery of destitution would have made a bitter mockery of a marked insistence on social deferences. Gaspar Ruiz understood this in his simplicity. From his captivity amongst the royalists, he could give them news of the people they knew. He described their appearance, and when he related the story of the battle in which he was recaptured, the two women lamented the blow to their cause and the ruin of their secret hopes. He had no feeling either way, but he felt a great devotion for that young girl. In his desire to appear worthy of her condescension, he boasted a little of his bodily strength. He had nothing else to boast of. Because of that quality, his comrades treated him with a great deference, he explained, as though he had been a sergeant, both in camp and in battle. I could always get as many as I wanted to follow me anywhere, senorita. I ought to have been made an officer, because I can read and write. Behind him, the silent old lady fetched a moaning sigh from time to time. The distracted father muttered to himself, pacing the sala, and Gaspar Ruiz would raise his eyes now and then to look at the daughter of these people. He would look at her with curiosity, because she was alive, and also with that feeling of familiarity and awe with which he had contemplated in churches the inanimate and powerful statues of the saints whose protection is invoked in dangers and difficulties. His difficulty was very great. He could not remain hiding in an orchard forever and ever. 
He knew also very well that before he had gone half a day's journey in any direction he would be picked up by one of the cavalry patrols scouring the country and brought into one or another of the camps where the Patriot Army, destined for the liberation of Peru, was collected. There he would in the end be recognized as Gaspar Ruiz, the deserter to the Royalists, and no doubt shot very effectually this time. There did not seem any place in the world for the innocent Gaspar anywhere, and at this thought his simple soul surrendered itself to gloom and resentment, as black as night. They had made him a soldier forcibly. He did not mind being a soldier, and he had been a good soldier as he had been a good son because of his docility and his strength, but now there was no use for either. They had taken him from his parents, and he could no longer be a soldier, not a good soldier at any rate. Nobody would listen to his explanations. What injustice it was! What injustice! And in a mournful murmur, he would go over the story of his capture and recapture for the twentieth time, then raising his eyes to the silent girl in the doorway. See, si, senorita, he would say with a deep sigh, injustice has made this poor breath in my body quite worthless to me and to anybody else, and I do not care who robs me of it. On the evening, as he exhaled, Thus the plaint of his wounded soul she condescended to say that, if she were a man, she would consider no life worthless which held the possibility of revenge. She seemed to be speaking to herself. Her voice was low. He drank in the gentle, as if dreamy sound, with a consciousness of peculiar delight, of something warming his breast like a draught of generous wine. True, senorita, he said, raising his face up to her slowly, there is Esteban, who must be shown that I am not dead after all. The mutterings of the mad father had ceased long before. The sighing mother had withdrawn somewhere into one of the empty rooms. All was still within as well as without, and the moonlight bright as day on the wild orchard full of inky shadows, Gaspar Ruiz saw the dark eyes of Dania Erminia look down at him. Elab, the sergeant, she muttered disdainfully. Why, he has wounded me with his sword, he protested, bewildered by the contempt that seemed to shine livid on her pale face. She crushed him with her glance. The power of her will to be understood was so strong that it kindled in him the intelligence of unexpressed things. What else did you expect me to do, he cried, as if suddenly driven to despair. Have I the power to do more? Am I a general with an army at my back, miserable sinner that I am to be despised by you at last? Senors, related the general to his guests, though my thoughts were of love then, and therefore enchanting, the sight of that house always affected me disagreeably, especially in the moonlight, when its close shutters and its air of lonely neglect appeared sinister. Still, I went on using the bridle path by the ravine, because it was a short cut. The mad royalist howled and laughed at me every evening to his complete satisfaction, but every time, as if wearied by my indifference, he ceased to appear in the porch. How they persuaded him to leave off I do not know. However, with Gaspar Ruiz in the house, there would have been no difficulty in restraining him by force. It was part of their policy in there to avoid anything which could provoke me, at least so I suppose. Notwithstanding my infatuation with the brightest pair of eyes in Chile, I noticed the absence of the old man after a week or so. A few more days passed. I began to think that perhaps these royalists had gone away somewhere else. But one evening, as I was hastening toward the city, I saw again somebody in the porch. It was not the madman. It was the girl. She stood holding on to one of the wooden columns, tall and white-faced, her big eyes sunk deep with privation and sorrow. I looked hard at her 
and she met my stare with a strange, inquisitive look. Then as I turned my head, after riding past, she seemed to gather courage for the act and absolutely beckoned me back. I obeyed, senores, almost without thinking, so great was my astonishment. It was greater still when I heard what she had to say. She began by thanking me for my forbearance for her father's infirmity, so that I felt ashamed of myself. I had meant to show disdain, not forbearance. Every word must have burnt her lips, but she never departed from a gentle and melancholy dignity which filled me with respect against my will. Senors, we are no match for women. But I could hardly believe my ears when she began her tale. Providence, she concluded, seemed to have preserved the life of that wronged soldier who now trusted to my honor as a caballero and to my compassion for his sufferings. Wronged man, I observed coldly. Well, I think so, too. And you have been harboring an enemy of your cause? He was a poor Christian, crying for help at our door in the name of God, Senor, she, she answered simply. I began to admire her. Where is he now? I asked stiffly. But she would not answer that question. With extreme cunning and an almost fiendish delicacy, she managed to remind me of my failure in saving the lives of the prisoners in the guard room, without wounding my pride. She knew, of course, the whole story. Gaspar Ruiz, she said, entreated me to procure for him a safe conduct from General San Martin himself. He had important communication to make to the commander-in-chief. Por Dios, senores! She made me swallow all that, pretending to be only the mouthpiece of that poor man. Overcome by injustice, he expected to find, she said, as much generosity in me as had been shown by him by the royalist family, which had been given him a refuge. Ha! It was all well and nobly said to a youngster like me. I thought her great. Alas, she was only implacable. In the end, I rode away very enthusiastic about the business, without demanding even to see Gaspar Ruiz, who I was confident was in the house. But on calm reflection, I began to see some difficulties which I had not confidence enough in myself to encounter. It was not easy to approach a commander-in-chief with such a story. I feared failure. At last, I thought it better to lay the matter before my general of division, Robles a friend of my family, who had appointed me his aide-de-camp lately. He took it out of my hands at once, without ceremony. In the house, of course, he is in the house, he said contemptuously. You ought to have gone sword in hand inside and demanded his surrender instead of chatting with a royalist girl in the porch. Those people should have been hunted out of that long ago. Who knows how many spies they have harbored right in the very midst of our camps. A safe conduct from the commander-in-chief? The audacity of the fellow. Ha, ha! Now, we shall catch him tonight, and then we shall find out, without any safe conduct, what he has got to say. That is so very important. Ha, ha, ha! General Robles, peace to his soul, was a short, thick man, with round, staring eyes, fierce and jovial, Seeing my distress, he added, Come, come, Chico, I promise you his life if he does not resist. And that is not likely. We are not going to break up a good soldier if it can be helped. I tell you what, I am curious to see your strong man. Nothing but a general would do for the Picaro. Well, he shall have a general to talk to. Ha <laughs> ha. I shall go myself to the catching. And you are coming with me, of course. And it was done that same night. Early in the evening, the house and the orchard was surrounded quietly. Later on, the general and I left a ball we were attending in town and rode out at an easy gallop. At some little distance from the house, we pulled up. A mounted orderly held our horses. A low whistle warned the men watching all along the ravine and we walked up to the porch swiftly. The barricaded house in the moonlight seemed empty. 
the general knocked at the door. After a time, a woman's voice within asked, Who was there? My chief nudged me hard. I gasped. It is I, Lieutenant Centiera. I stammered out as if choked. Open the door. It came open slowly. The girl, holding a thin taper in her hand, seeing another man with me, began to back away before us slowly, shading the light with her hand. Her impassive white face looked ghostly. I followed behind General Robles. Her eyes were fixed on mine. I made a gesture of helplessness behind my chief's back, trying at the same time to give a reassuring expression to my face. Neither of us three uttered a sound. We found ourselves in a room with bare floor and walls. There was a rough table and a couple of stools in it, nothing else whatever. An old woman with her gray hair hanging loose wrung her hands when we appeared. A peal of loud laughter resounded through the empty house, very amazing and weird, and this old woman tried to get part of us. Nobody to leave the room, said General Robles to me. I swung the door to, heard the latch click, and the laughter became faint in our ears. Before another word could be spoken in that room, I was amazed by hearing the sound of distant thunder. I had carried in with me into the house a vivid impression of a beautiful, clear, moonlit night, without a speck of cloud in the sky. I could not believe my ears. Sent early abroad for my education, I was not familiar with the most dreaded natural phenomenon of my native land. I saw with inexpressible astonishment a look of terror in my chief's eyes. Suddenly I felt giddy. The general staggered against me heavily. The girl seemed to reel in the middle of the room. The taper fell out of her hand, and the light went out. A shrill cry of, Monsieur Cordiel, from the old woman, pierced my ears. In the pitchy darkness I heard the plaster off the walls falling on the floor. It is a mercy there was no ceiling. Holding on to the latch of the door, I heard the grinding of the roof tile cease above my head. The shock was over. "'Out of the house! The door! Fly, Santiago, fly!' howled the general. "'You know, senors, in our country the bravest are not ashamed of the fear of an earthquake strikes into all the senses of man. One never gets used to it. Repeated experience only augments the mastery of that nameless terror.' It was my first earthquake, and I was the calmest of them all. I understood that the crash outside was caused by the porch, with its wooden pillars and tiled roof projection falling down. The next shock would destroy the house, maybe. That rumble, as of thunder, was approaching again. The general was rushing round the room to find the door, perhaps. He made a noise as though he were trying to climb the walls and I heard him distinctly invoke the names of several saints. Out, out, Santiago, he yelled. The girl's voice was the only one I did not hear. General, I cried, I cannot move the door. We must be locked in. I did not recognize his voice in the shout of malediction and despair he let out. Senors, I know. Many men in my country, especially in the provinces most subject to earthquakes, who will neither eat, sleep, pray, nor even sit down to cards with closed doors. The danger is not in the loss of time, but in this, that the movement of the walls may prevent a door being opened at all. This was what had happened to us. We were trapped, and we had no help to expect from anybody. There is no man in my country who will go into a house when the earth trembles. There never was, except one, Gaspar Ruiz. He had come out of whatever hole he had been hiding in outside and had clambered over the timbers of the destroyed porch. Above the awful subterranean groan of coming destruction, I heard a mighty voice shouting the word, Erminia, with the lungs of a giant. An earthquake is a great leveler of distinctions. I clicked at all my resolution against the terror of the scene. She is here, I shouted back. A roar, as of a furious wild beast, answered me. 
while my head swam, my heart sank, and the sweat of anguish streamed like rain off my brow. He had the strength to pick up one of the heavy posts of the porch, holding it under his armpit like a lance, but with both hands he charged madly the rocking house with the force of a battering ram, bursting open the door and rushing in headlong over our prostrate bodies. I and the general, picking ourselves up, bolted out together without looking round once till we got across the road. Then, clinging to each other, we beheld the house change suddenly into a heap of formless rubbish behind the back of a man who staggered towards us, bearing the form of a woman clasped in his arms, her long black hair nearly to his feet. He laid her down reverently on the heaving earth, and the moonlight shone in her closed eyes. Senors, we mounted with difficulty. Our horses, getting up, plunged madly, held by the soldiers who had come running from all sides. Nobody thought of catching Gaspar Ruiz then. The eyes of men and animals shone with wild fear. My general approached Gaspar Ruiz, who stood motionless as a statue above the girl. He let himself be shaken by the shoulders without detaching his eyes from her face. "'You are the bravest man living. You have saved my life,' shouted the general in his ear. "'Come to my quarters tomorrow, if God gives us the grace to see another day.' He never stirred, as if deaf, without feeling, insensible. We rode away for the town, full of our relations, of our friends, of whose fate we hardly dared to think. The soldiers ran by the sight of our horses. Everything was forgotten in the immensity of the catastrophe overtaking a whole country. Gaspar Ruiz saw the girl open her eyes. The raising of her eyelids seemed to recall him from a trance. They were alone. The cries of terror and distress from homeless people filled the plains of the coast, remote and immense, coming like a whisper into their loneliness. She rose swiftly to her feet, darting fearful glances on all sides. "'What is it?' she cried out low and peering into his face. "'Where am I?' He bowed his head sadly, without a word. "'Who are you?' He knelt down slowly before her and touched the hem of her coarse black bay's skirt. "'Your slave,' he said. She caught sight then of the heap of rubbish that had been the house, all misty in the cloud of dust. Ah, she cried, pressing her hand to her forehead. I carried you out from there, he whispered at her feet. And they, she asked in a great sob. He rose and, taking her by the arms, led her gently towards the shapeless ruin, half overwhelmed by a landslide. Come and listen, he said. The serene moon saw them clambering over the heap of stones, joists, tiles, which was a grave. They pressed their ears to interstices, listening for the sound of a groan, for a sigh of pain. At last, he said, they died swiftly. You are alone. She sat down on a piece of broken timber and put one arm across her face. He waited, then approaching his lips to her ear, let us go, he whispered. Never, never from here, she cried out, flinging her arms above her head. He stood over her, and her raised arms fell upon his shoulders. He lifted her up, steadied himself, and began to walk, looking straight before him. "'What are you doing?' she asked feebly. "'I am escaping from my enemies,' he said, never once glancing at his light burden. "'With me?' she sighed helplessly. "'Never without you,' he said. "'You are my strength.' He pressed her close to him, his face was grave and his footsteps steady, the conflagrations bursting out in the ruins of destroyed villages dotted the plain with red fires and the sounds of distant lamentations, the cries of misericordia made a desolate murmur in his ears. He walked on, solemn and collected as if carrying something holy, fragile and precious. The earth rocked at times under his feet. 